faculty page, you can kind of go down there, click on me, um, and I, I thought it was only fitting to bring more or less a replica of that thing. Uh, that was when I was in Konya. Um, it just so happened that uh, my girlfriend while I was there was at a, a dance a dance school, dance and art and, and photography uh, school, and this was just on the on the wall there. So I, I had this assignment for, for the scholarship I was applying to called the uh, Knight Tennessee, it's at Stanford, and the, their prompt was teach me something. And so that that's where the concept of this talk came from. Um, and it, it was it was about gravity. And so while I was there in the Netherlands, I went to a a fabric store and bought this giant sheet of spandex, um, which I also now from Tiziana's lab I have uh, some some giant masses that I can use. Uh, but I thought it was it would be fun to bring this uh, because it just so happens that my landlord is a Pitzer alum uh, and also has been an academic until recently retiring. And upon arriving, uh, you know maybe three or four months ago, this was in my room already. Um, so the very first thing I did was uh, I told her, okay, this is going to my office immediately. Um, so it's, it's usually hanging up in my office, but I thought uh, because you know that that picture is there, it kind of it's uh, fitting. And also, I wanted to give a shout out. I don't know if any of them are here, but uh, last week we had the uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion mixer at uh, Keck, and so I have all these things printed out thanks to them. Uh, so they are uh, wonderful. It was an awesome mixer. So all that info is. is basically right there if you'd like to take any of the end. Um, but what I wanted to point this to was, in particular, this website. Um, in, in case you ever are in need of any kind of um, application help, uh, so for instance, grad school, um, Fulbright, um, a, a student of mine um, is, is applying to the Fulbright, and I think she has a wonderful application, and she happens to be walking towards me at this very moment. Um, and she, uh, and so, so if, you, if you're a senior right now, I, I um, uh, can't help because the deadline is, is like tomorrow. Um, but if you are a junior, um, if you're a junior right now and are looking into uh, the Fulbright, which is basically a, a chance to study abroad after you graduate college, um, either, either teaching English or, uh, or doing research or getting a master's, um, and I love helping people with it. Um, so I just wanted to point that out before, before we start, just to kind of ground like, who am I? You know, just starting here. So, I want to talk about gravity today, and mostly about why the thing that we learned maybe in, in high school or in college is not accurate. It's accurate in very small, limited cases, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to model the universe on this sheet of spandex. So I need four volunteers who are going to stretch this spandex out as I put this very heavy metal ball in the center of it and spin a planet around it. Four volunteers who can help pull this thing away. Got one, three more, got two, three. And I'll also, I, I realized um, later on, awesome, cool, we got four. Um, I realized as I was, I was looking through this talk this morning that I, I kind of I go back to this uh, this thing later on, so it's it's up to you guys whether or not you want to like you know continue to sit in the front row and pull this up later, um, or or we can just do all our kind of experiments um, at once. Um, yeah, so, be careful on the edge. <laughs> awesome, cool. Okay, so let's just say that this is the sun. Okay, so based on any kind of conception about gravity, what you know, like anything, anything you know about gravity, um, can anyone explain to me uh, what just happened? Anything? What happens when two things come together to each other? Forgetting for the moment about the sheet. So the sheet, the sheet is going to help us understand Einstein. But if there were no sheet, you know, there's just the sun and some earth orbiting around it. This may look familiar. This is what's called Newton's Law of Gravity. So it tells us about the two masses. This is, could be M1, that could be M2. The strength of gravity, that's like this G constant, and the distance between them, which is like R. So for instance, the force is, is a little bit weaker out here than it is when it's right here, because it's really close. See how fast it moves? This is how slow it moves initially out here. Oh, cool. 
Okay, so that was what, you know, that's what people were using for hundreds of years. Einstein did this in, in the late 1600s. Einstein wasn't until the early 1900s. Um, what's wrong with this? Uh, so this is a word, uh, German, that, that Einstein used to use all the time, and uh, he used it so much that there's an entire Wikipedia article on it. Um, Einstein's the different things that he dreamt up in his uh, crazy brain. Um, one of which is the following. Uh, what would happen if uh, I have, you know, I'm just orbiting, my, my planet is orbiting, the sun is going around, but what would happen if like at the snap of my fingers, the sun just disappeared? What would happen immediately to the ball? Not like with any, any time, because if you, if you go back to Einstein's equation, I'm sorry, Newton's equation, none of these things are dependent on time. That G thing is just a constant. It tells you how strong the gravity is. The mass is just the mass of this thing. It doesn't change over time. This doesn't change over time. And that, at a given instant, like I take a, a, a screenshot or a, I take a picture, that doesn't change either. It's, it's a given separation. So if there's no time, that means as soon as this thing disappears, it'll be like, um, what is that when a track person does the thing over the head? A shot put? A hammer throw. A hammer, yes, the hammer throw. So if, if, if they cut the chain on their hammer throw, it would go flying away instantly, which is an issue based on Einstein's theory. Um, and pardon me, this slide I just noticed five minutes ago was not up to speed. Here it is for just a second before I go back to that one. So Einstein, his theory of special relativity, which was his first uh, innovation in 1905, this actually came by looking at electricity and magnetism, which is this, you know things things of charge, things of magnetism, and what he found was that the interaction between those two things happens at the speed of light. So there is a and moreover that speed of light is the absolute fastest that anything can move because the things that are interacting between charges and magnets don't have any mass. So it's like how fast can something with a mass go? Well, the limit is if it didn't have any mass. And so that's, that's this concept of a photon. So what's wrong? If this just disappears instantly, then as soon as I snap my fingers, this flies off. Which tells us that information, and this is a property known in physics as non-locality, so this tells me that something happening here immediately influences something happening over here, which is not cool. That's like a, the, the speed limit of the universe is the speed of light. And uh, what we can know, um, if you were to calculate the distance that the speed of light travels, that's a known quantity. So you can look at how far away we are from the sun and say how long that would take. So the absolute maximum time with which we would just fly off like the hammer being cut on that track person is like eight minutes later. So the sun would disappear and eight minutes and then we would know. So not only would we not fly off for eight minutes, we would still see the sun shining because light hasn't even reached us for that amount of time. So how do we use our sheet to figure out this? So firstly, Newton even know something was wrong. This is actually kind of like a, a primary source where Newton wrote this to his friend. Uh, we can read it in very uh, 1600s um, connotations. That one body may act upon another and distance through a vacuum without the mediation of anything else the through which their action and force may be conveyed from one to another is to me so great an absurdity that I believe no man in his philosophical matters has a competent faculty of thinking that they may have a into it. Um, so that was, yeah, that's, that's Newton saying that my theory's wrong. Um, and something's wrong with it, so what, what's going on? Uh, equipped with what they had in the 1600s. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot to go back to that. So now that we're, we're, we have this new, new thing of Einstein, we haven't described what it is yet, but we'll get there. What can I say differently about what's happening now? Like, we have the universe. The universe is my, my sheet of fabric. And now I put some mass into it. And what happens, right? Now it's kind of like this just flat surface. But then I put that there. And now my whole, my whole universe is different. My universe before 
And here's where I'll, I'll, I'll spare you guys, so I don't, you don't have to keep uh, holding it up. So for instance, um, this is something I'll mention later. Um, if we hold it super taut, what happens, um, this is, yeah, there we go, there we go, okay. Um, what happens if I were to roll my ball um, along my universe, and it's flat? That's about a straight line. I, you can just let it fall off this place. Kind of like a straight line. What happens now if I have a curved thing? Believe it or not, the definition of a straight line depends on the surface that it moves on. So even though it traveled in a straight line before, this, and we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, we'll, we'll get there. I just want to spare you guys so you're not holding your arms up for ten or five minutes. This is also a straight line. That is just, it, the definition of a straight line depends on the geometry that you're working with. So we'll get, thank you all very, very much. Please, round of applause. We'll circle back to that last uh, demo um, in, in a few minutes. Um, I just want to spare them so we're sitting there for more. Okay, so how does this tell us something about, about how, how, can, how can this resolve um, our, our, our picture here? Firstly, um, I wanted to point out um, a quote that, that gives, gives Einstein's theory in a particularly easy way to understand. Um, it is an English statement, um, which is by the author of, uh, I brought a lot of props today because we happen to have uh, an actual expert in the audience who, uh, who is nice enough to lend me this book, Kevin, uh, another, <laughs> another visitor in the physics department. I have always had a PDF of this, but it is six pounds, and it's its own source of gravitation, as Kevin says. Um, so I have never wanted to actually purchase it. Um, but one of the authors, uh, Wheeler, said that the way that you can think of Einstein's theory is that, one, matter curves space-time. So that was me dropping the big ball into the center. right? It was flat, and then I dropped the ball into it, and now my universe is different. And the second, is that now that the space is curved, it tells me how the ball moves. So the ball moves differently because there's, there's mass in it. Um, and yeah, so I wanted to point out this. I don't have that. Um, this is a particularly uh, light uh, uh, book of gravity. But I also wanted to point out that one of my absolute favorites, books of, of relativity, if you are just learning about general relativity, is actually written by a Pomona professor. Um, so this was, this was what I used when I was in college. And so I have yet to get it signed by him, but I will absolutely be coming over to his office to get it signed. Um, so I wanted to uh, talk about um, what, what each side of those equations mean. So that even though it's a, a verbal sentence, we can think about it like an equation. Uh, mass curves space-time, and space-time tells matter how to move. So that's kind of, that's our equation that we're gonna, we're gonna try to, uh, to figure out here. So, not only does that, so we've, we've kind of established what Einstein's theory is about, but why does that fix the problem? The problem was that if the sun disappeared, the earth immediately shoots away, why does this, why does this help? If you imagine um, this, the sun was here and I kind of um, just immediately, you know, it snaps away, it's kind of like the opposite of a drop going into water. Like the, the, the space time or the fabric would like snap backwards and it would send out a wave. So that wave has a speed. It can't, you know, a wave is, isn't going to travel perfectly, um, you know, at an instant. And so this, these gravitational waves are the way that we, you know, kind of respond to this motion. And this was actually um, done only a few years ago, exactly 100 years ago after Einstein um, crafted his theory in 1915. In 2016, they were detected, and actually, one of the people who won the Nobel Prize in 2017 is this one, Thorne. Uh, another uh, way that you may uh, know Kip Thorne, uh, if anyone has seen um, Interstellar, uh, that, that kind of uh, crazy uh, outer space movie, uh, he was the lead scientist on that movie. So he is like a huge name. Wheeler was like uh, the older of the three. The other two were his PhD students. Um, and Kip Thorne is, is 
very famous. Uh, he's, been, he's been publishing uh, since then. So now that we have this kind of verbal, this verbal uh, thing of, of Einstein, I want to get a little bit more mathematical. And that's, that's my goal today is to get as mathematical as possible without scaring anyone. Um, you know, who didn't, who didn't come to be bombarded with, with equations. Um, and so at various points, I'm going to be taking screenshots of, of really cool Wikipedia articles, but I'm going to be hiding some serious stuff. So I'm going to, I might not always uh, uh, replace it with a cat who's scared of math, but it will be blank. And so that is me hiding some of the, the, the math. Hopefully there are no mathematicians in the audience who are offended by this. Um, but I'm, I'm going to be hiding some of the stuff that is, is different. Because this, this theory of differential geometry, is a field of mathematics that describes everything that we just talked about. How the curvature of that surface influences the things that go on around it. So this is a complete math article. And yet, in the very, this is the introduction on Wikipedia. Its, its main kind of um, application is the whole theory of general relativity is really based in differential geometry. So differential geometry, in, in the form that Einstein used, it was around 1850 or so, uh, Riemann, um, and, and Einstein really just took off and, and formed like the, um, kind of was the proponent of the modern formalism of it. So remember when I talked about the, uh, the, the one that I did uh, so that they could sit down, the, uh, the ball rolling in a straight line. So in a flat space, that was a straight line. But once it was curved, that wasn't a straight line anymore. Um, and so one really easy way to understand that is to think about something that we, we take for granted, that maybe you learn this in, I always forget when you learn things, maybe pre-calc in high school. I, I, don't, I don't remember when you learn, uh, or, or maybe, I, I don't know. Uh, whenever you learn that the, uh, the sum of the angles in a triangle is equal to 180, you are working like with a triangle on your desk, but you're not working with a triangle on the Earth. So for instance, if you were to try to draw a triangle on the Earth, such that, let's just say this is like one quarter of the Earth. So you've got uh, one side of your triangle along the equator, the exact same side length. So if this is, you know, if we say that the Earth is a perfect sphere, this is like one quarter of the circumference. This is like one quarter of the circumference. And this is like one quarter of the circumference. So it is an equilateral triangle, right? That's the definition that all those sides are the same. But now if you look at, at what a straight line is along this circle, and, and maybe you've, you've seen it when you, when you maybe if you've uh, been on a plane or if you've seen, uh, seen plane you know, uh, videos in, in, in movies, when you're on a plane, and you look at things like, uh, for instance, uh, where are we going? Here. So when you're on a plane, sometimes you'll see like, uh, why are we going that far? Like that, that doesn't make sense. Why are we, why are we wasting all that fuel to go, to go from there to there? Why wouldn't we just do like a straight line like that? Well, that is a straight line because you're not taking into account that the map that they're showing you on your airplane is is the Earth. So that that straight line. The definition of it is different when you're when you're on a curved surface. So that's why that ball that flew in a straight line had all those wild uh, actions because that was a straight line just on a curved surface. So, for instance, with the with the triangle, now if this is coming at a one quarter, so one quarter of a three sixty, right, that three sixty would be like the degrees in a circle. One quarter of that is 90 degrees. So instead of the corners being 60 degrees like they were previously to add up to 180 and the thing that we, we always know about, now the equal angle triangle on a sphere has a much different value. So our first equation, I hope it doesn't scare you, we will talk verbally about it. We, I won't be defining any of these things, like for instance, all those little uh, Greek letters, the, the mu and the nu, we can, we can just, just look at things and what they, they are verbally. So for instance, all these things with the blue arrow, they are things, uh, blue arrows on the left hand side. Those are things that tell me, they're, they're formulas and they're, they're things that I can calculate about the space being curved. They give me an exact amount of curvature. So for instance, if I put this big ball in the center, how much curvature? And those on the left are all quantities that tell me about that. 
One of the things on the left that we won't talk about, but is, is more or less the subject of a whole other talk, is the fact that Einstein included this thing, which is called the cosmological constant. So it kind of spawned this field of cosmology, looking at the Big Bang, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and Einstein actually famously called this uh, the biggest blunder of his life. Uh, he, he included it for the wrong reason, uh, and then said, oh no, never mind, uh, it's wrong. And then he was like, oh no, no, uh, it, was, it was right. Uh, because uh, that actually accounts for the acceleration of the universe. That the universe started at a point, like the Big Bang, and it expanded outwards. So that, that constant there is the entire field of cosmology, of dark matter and dark energy is pretty much summed up in that quantum theory. And Einstein was, was under the misconception that the, the universe should be kind of like static, as opposed to, to moving like that. On the left hand side, or the right hand side, um, the K, or this little kappa, is just a constant. It's like uh, in the F equals G, M, M, R squared. Um, it was like the G. It, it's something that tells us how strong uh, the gravity is. Over there, we have something that's going to tell us about how much matter is in the system. So that, that quantity is like, Basically, that quantity you can just think of as the mass of the ball. It's like how much, how much mass, and how much curvature. These are known. This is kind of the bread and butter of Einstein's theory. It is uh, a mathematical way to say that. Remember, the first side of that quote was that matter curves spacetime. So this was this is Einstein's equation or equations. Um, that those are those little uh, Latin numbers or letters down there, the mu and the nu, um, tell you that there are, there are different coordinates and so you can have more than one equation. The next equation is, is the, the latter half of this. Um, this is where I, I mentioned, uh, this was the, the straight line demo I was going to do later, but this is way too late, so I was happy that I, just, I, just, I had, did, it, did it early. Um, the latter half, that space-time, so the curvature, once the space-time is curved, there's some mass in it, the space-time is curved, and so that dictates how the matter is going to move. So it tells you what a straight line is. And that's the principle that, that objects follow a straight line. No matter what their, their situation is, their environment, they follow a straight line. And that's the principle of a geodesic. Something follows uh, whatever the path of least resistance is, really. And this is kind of like Einstein's version of Newton's law. So Newton's second law is F equals ma. Instead of forces, remember the forces were, were our initial conception, but now we're thinking about curvature. Here we have this. Einstein's version of F, F equals ma is how much acceleration, this is like if you multiply everything by m, it's, it's identical, more or less, to uh, Newton's second law. Here, we're talking about the motion of the particle, so its acceleration, how it moves, when there is some curvature. Over here, we have the equivalent of acceleration, but without the curvature present. And this, another geometric quantity, which I'll circle back to later, um, it's, it's mentioned in that uh, scary differential geometry Wikipedia uh, screenshot, um, is a geometric quantity that tells you how much the space time is curved based on how much matter is in it. So those are the two directions. Those are like um, matter tells space time how to curve, and the curvature is space time in turn tells you how the planet orbits. I, I always like to think of it as the sun is causing the curvature, the planet is responding to the curvature. So that, in, in a nutshell, is Einstein's theory of general relativity. So it's, it's, not, it's, it's more or less taking our sheet example and putting some mathematical curvature quantities to it. But that's not the end of the story. Um, there is, in fact, um, regions of our universe where uh, we cannot just think about things as being uh, you know, really spread apart. More or less, you can, you can think about gravity as the theory of uh, really far apart, you know, big, big things. There are other aspects of our universe that are really small. Like, for instance, um, particle accelerators, when things uh, uh, collide together. Um, anyone in you know, chemistry is quantum. Every, more or less every applied uh, physics has quantum mechanics in it, a, a lot of the time. Um, so when things are very small, gravity and very small things don't link up very nicely together. And so what we've so far 
the things that do link up nicely together are those other forces in nature. So uh, electric charges, magnetic charges, um, when a nucleus decays, so that known as beta decay, when something is like, it's kind of like the nuclear, nuclear reaction of things, things decaying and losing. Or we have the strong force, so this is the weak force, the weak nuclear force, electromagnetism, and the strong force, which is more or less uh, that particles, like uh, a proton, that you've got molecules for biology, atoms for chemistry, and then you have like quarks. So you have like, inside your atom you have you know, protons, uh, neutrons, electrons. Inside those, which are called subatomic particles, you have uh, things like quarks and gluons that are, that are kind of holding things together. And so if you look at you know, all these tables of uh, the standard model of particle physics, they give you all these lists of different particles and here are where they, they are, they're particles that interact through different forces. So for instance, any particle interacts with gravity. It didn't, it didn't matter what type of particle it was, it just that it had mass. In quantum mechanics, which is the kind of backbone of the standard model of particle physics, which, like gravity, they're, they're two completely separate but very, very well rigorously tested theories. Uh, gravitational waves, black holes, all uh, the precession of mercury, all these things are very well established successes for Einstein's theory of gravity. And yet, uh, all these things about the standard model, that all these forces, three of the four forces are kind of joined together in this one theory. They can predict new particles. Um, they are, they're the Higgs boson in 2012, so a little bit later, but all these things, these, these accelerators at LHC in Switzerland, um, closest one to here is probably um, uh, the one at UCLA. So we've, we've got all these things, of course not the huge accelerator of the one at CERN, but these things do not men, uh, kind of mesh together very well. So in order to get these things to go together, it's kind of driven by this desire that if three of the four fundamental forces can be united with one theory, uh, why can't the fourth, it, 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 it kind of, doesn't make sense that there are these, these two completely separate um, theories of physics. For most of, of, of physics, you can use them separately. You can use things uh, when you're working with big distances and heavy masses. You can use gravity when you're studying more or less all of astronomy. Um, unless you're doing cosmology, you can kind of forget about um, quantum mechanics. However, there are, when you're doing cosmology and astrophysics, there are two particularly notable instances of situations where you have gravity and quantum mechanics. And so things, things get messy, and there's currently no way to figure them out. These two things I'm discussing, one of them I've already talked about, is the inception of the universe. The current uh, theory that everyone is kind of um, more or less on the same page about, I'd say probably 90%, is that uh, the Big Bang started at a point and all of our universe came from a point. So at you know, time equals zero, everything is, is crunched together in a very, very small, um, you know, almost like a point particle. And so from nothing came everything, and very quickly. So in the first few seconds of the universe, it exploded outwards and became from you know, time equals zero to time equals one was quantum and gravity. So these two fields are, are almost interacting with each other at the same time. So we've got these two aspects, and black holes are another aspect because it's like, it would be like if instead of this sphere that I put on this sheet, it would be like if there was a hole, it, like a, it was pulling down all the way to the floor and it went to the center of the earth. It would be like something with so much mass that we wouldn't even be able to, to see the thing that's causing the mass. And that's, that's where the name black hole comes from. Because the light that is use it, that enables you to see it can't even escape. So it's something so heavy that even the lightest thing, like light, the photon has no mass, can't escape from it. So these two areas are both things that, as humans, um, and also driven by the desire to kind of have one theory. If we have one theory for the standard model, and so um, you know, it's debatable whether it's pretty or not, um, but driven by this desire to have things 
logically makes sense, it, it, it's kind of one of our um, drives as, as a species, or especially as physicists, to, to make things logically sound, to have things um, characterized and to have like a chart and recognize the patterns and be able to, to go back and forth between these two things. And so that's, that's one of the kind of main objectives of uh, particle accelerators. At the moment, the particle accelerators can reach a quite high energy, somewhere in between here. And so there is an ability to unite the three forces at the moment. So we've, we've gotten to the point where uh, particles in Switzerland are allowed to go as fast as, as we can get them, and they collide. And because they're moving very, very quickly, they collide and they cause an enormous amount of energy. Um, because this is kind of the particle physics uh, side of this graph, and the cosmology side is that with higher and higher energy, you can go further and further back in time. That's what you can look at, really. And that's kind of, it's trying to mold in this graph of the proposal. So the proposal is, at the Big Bang, because everything was small and big at you know, almost the exact, the exact same time, all the forces should unite, or we would like them to. It would be really nice if they did, um, because then we could have this quote unquote theory of everything, something that describes um, all the fundamental forces in one kind of systematic way. So that, this is the proposal. This is completely um, not confirmed uh, yet. Uh, this is the only confirmed part. So what's the deal? What's the progress? What have we um, been able to do? Um, some things that you may have known um, or, or at least heard buzzwords on, on maybe, um, well, the Big Bang Theory, the shell maybe. Um, Sheldon Cooper, I think, works on string theory. Um, that's currently the most uh, well-received um, method to get there. So string theory is something that takes quantum field theory. So quantum field theory is more or less, you can view this as the standard model of particle physics, and tries to add gravity to it. So this is a, a kind of figure known as the Bronstein cube. It's, it's something that relates all these different fields of physics. So here, classical mechanics is more or less 1600s Newton, all the people, uh, you know, Lagrange in the 1700s and Newton. Special relativity, Einstein, 1905. Einstein and others, quantum mechanics. Actually, Einstein never won a Nobel Prize for relativity. Uh, they just said uh, fundamental contributions to theoretical physics, especially the photoelectric effect, which was a quantum mechanics topic. So he never actually won the Nobel for, for this amazing theory, um, as well as many, many other people in the 1920s. General relativity. Was 19, uh, Einstein was very busy in the early 1900s, 1915 or 1916. Newtonian gravity, around the same time as classical mechanics. Newton in his Principia kind of did the whole thing at once. Uh, two corners of this have kind of not been well uh, charted yet. So the ones that have been well charted, the standard model and GR, using kind of the edges of the Tvonstein cube, those are the two routes that people have taken so far. The other being um, loop quantum gravity, which is kind of trying to add quantum mechanics. So like kind of instead of having a continuous space, making your sheet like a bunch of little links here and trying to get it like a quantized system out of your space time. Um, both of these are, you know, you can find uh, popular science books on these. Um, I would say, if you'd like to know about this red arrow, I would say Brian Green, incredible uh, popular science book. Uh, it's really kind of like a inspiration for how this talk goes. Um, Carlo Rovelli uh, is another uh, popular science author who does that era. There is no popular science book uh, for that mystery green arrow yet. Um, the reason for that is the whole point of why this is hard is small things and big things. Quantum gravity is both a small thing and a big thing. It doesn't matter whether or not it's Relativistic. So relativistic means things are moving very fast. So uh, relativistic would be like uh, the light, like a particle of light going on the sheet. Just because things are moving slowly, that doesn't mean rel non-relativistic quantum gravity is easy. Um, however, the topic of, of what I did in my Fulbright was that there is a way, there is a mathematical structure behind the standard model and a mathematical structure behind gravity and they can actually be used as the same thing. So it's a very weird 
um, kind of a what gives moment, is that you can view not only the standard model as what's called the gauge theory, and I'll, I'll discuss that in, in the next section, but you can also view general relativity as a gauge theory. This was done uh, around the time the standard model started to happen. The first things in the standard model were maybe Yang Mills in like the 1950s. Very soon after that, people started to say, oh, we can probably do that with general relativity too. What I did for my Fulbright was more or less, um, and you can find the abstract here, I won't uh, do, it's, we're gonna try to minimize the jargon and things like that. Um, but more or less what I did was I took a paper from 2011, which was about 20 pages, and I turned it into like, I think like 170 pages. So it was, uh, no, no, no. Um, yeah, so it's, it's uh, the objective was to be as pedagogical as possible and try to um, start from the basics of like an undergraduate uh, physics and math and go like, where, what, what is this gauge theory? Like what, what is it and why can gravity apparently be formulated in, in terms of it? And moreover, why can a non-relativistic string theory, it doesn't have to be a string theory, that's just um, my advisor was a particularly famous string theorist, so he chose to, uh, to look at things in terms of strings as opposed to uh, loop quantum gravity. Um, so if we have now this charted, there's now, that green arrow is no longer this. And so there's, there's like three routes to a theory of everything. And so that's, that's a really big deal. Um, and and the, the formalism that goes behind this um, is just absolutely beautiful. It, it unites kind of a slew of different uh, areas of mathematics, in particular uh, theory of algebra and the theory of geometry. Um, this is kind of a, this kind of subtitle I have here is a quote from uh, the math, uh, mathematician physicist Eugene Wigner, um, who, who was kind of astounded by how effective the fields of mathematics that were already established are at giving us new results in physics. So here I've got a video, and it, it's uh, it's going to be very um, very small and, and quick. I just more or less wanted to um, show you the table of contents of differential geometry and why. So you're scrolling down. This was that thing that I put the cat on before. Um, if you scroll down on differential geometry, you're going to see these things in the table of contents, which are completely, at first, unrelated topics. One of them has to do with algebra. So how does anything about algebra have anything to do with the curvature of space? Through this field called gauge theory, which, again, tons of blanked out things here. I'm going to blank out uh, as much as I possibly can to, to get away with what we're doing. This topic of Lie groups and Lie algebras, it's like a symmetry. So for instance, um, the fact that this book um, is sitting in that direction means that if I flip it like that, you can tell the difference. But uh, if there were no markings, my 10-year-old Nalgene bottle is almost perfect for this demo, um, but if there were no markings on it, you wouldn't be able to tell that I had rotated my cup if, I, if I'd done that. And so there are these, these Things of symmetry, and this kind of um, was brought about by Emmy Noether, one of the most famous um, uh, math mathematical physicists of all time, really. She understood that if there is a symmetry in nature, then there is some conserved quantity that corresponds to it. So in our, uh, the fields of mathematics, and this gets back to, to Wigner's uh, topic, these Lie algebras and, and groups, these, these things that tell us about, for instance, uh, the Lie algebra for this would be a circle. So you're, you're moving about a circle and the different kind of generators that you can, you can use. So what, what types of symmetry does this have? You spin it around in a circle and the things stay the same. So how many different ways can you possibly spin that circle? Well, there's kind of like an infinite number of ways, really, because it's a circle. If this book didn't have any markings on it, there would be much less than an infinite number of ways that you could do it. You could flip it like that. Well, that looks different. You could flip it like that. So if it had no markings, you could probably flip it maybe four ways, right? So that's what's called a discrete group. It's, it's a, the group of four rotations. But when you start to talk about continuous things like this, 
it's like an infinite group. So there are an infinite number of ways that I can turn this thing and you not notice that I changed it. And those uh, symmetries that you go about things is what form really the basis of the standard model. So it turns out that the ways that different particles can interact with each other are they have a symmetry to them. There's only a certain way that they can interact. And those are, those are studied and documented. And those can be used with this lead algebra business. So characterizing the ways that the particles can interact with each other and putting them onto the already well-established um, algebras or groups that that corresponds to is a way that you can build the standard model from these, these different ways to connect different, different types of particles. So the particle, uh, this one can, you know, you rotate it four ways and it can, it can do that, or this one you can rotate infinitely. How do those things interact with each other? And it turns out, uh, which was uh, not at all clear to me, as, as a, a math and physics major, I learned about these two things completely separately. Um, I learned about algebra and geometry, but then I, I learned about physics and I never had any, there was no communication between the two. Um, it turns out that this, remember, this is from uh, the differential geometry we get. This is all under the umbrella of the theory that Einstein used to craft his theory. You can use that same theory to connect th that all, the, all those symmetry things I was just talking about with the standard model. You can use those on curved space. And that curvature is a way that you can make a gauge theory so using the symmetries of the space-time that's around you, you can use the, the same formalisms of gauge theory to make an algebra out of that, or go backwards, start with an algebra, and craft the theory to match it. And th those are two, both of those th things are two things that you can do in either the standard model, so here we have the standard model, and the different symmetries that correspond to them. This one is the one of the circle, these are a little too, um, they're, they're more of a matrices um, or, or rotations. They're a special sort of rotation that the thing looks kind of the same if you rotate it in a very special way. Um, and because of the way of which these, like the, even though there are an infinite number of rotations I can do, there was only one rotation I was doing. So it was like, I can, how much I rotate, like I can do a quarter turn, a little bit of a turn, 15 turns, that's the, there were infinite number of those, but I'm still just turning. So that's, that's one symmetry, so that's what this, this one symmetry generator, and that's why there's one particle. So that one particle is what Emmy Noether uh, meant when she said there's one conserved thing with one symmetry. So there's a link between symmetries and conservations. But this, this is all kind of uh, standard model stuff, but it turns out that you can do the same thing for gravity. Um, so, if it can, this is a, a kind of a huge clue as to why there is now this kind of third route to get to a theory of quantum gravity, because you can use the kind of structure of algebra and geometry to build up not only um, Einstein's theory, but Newton's theory, as well as craft your own theory of a non-relativist string theory. And then you can use the different kind of um, limits between those two things to get to your new, your new path. So it's like a new, instead of those you know, two arrows that were already well established and have not kind of, um, right, they're, they're solid theories, but we can't detect them yet because uh, the, the, the CERN or, or LAC can't reach that high enough energy yet. So that was more or less the, the, the topic of, of my research when I first learned about this. Um, and in doing so, um, I used this software, maybe a, a database um, called uh, InspireHack. It's it's a high energy physics. It's where you can where you can look at things and see who's working on what, uh, when they publish it, like who they cite, and things like that. So I was maybe uh, maybe a month or two away from writing my thesis for the Fulbright, and I noticed uh, this is my advisor's InspireHack page. So I was thinking, ah, I mean, this was, this was written seven years ago. Here's that paper that I turned into many more than I needed. And I was looking at who had cited it. And I was thinking, oh, maybe someone had cited it and, and they explained it. You know, maybe a review article had, had done this. And so I was looking down and I, I said, wait, is that condensed matter? Like that's it, everything. It was like high energy, high energy theory and gravity. 
all these people which were citing it from the same field. And then all of a sudden this person is, is citing it from a completely different topic of physics. And so this, this particular topic, what I've, what I've learned, is that it has so much to do with, uh, it, its inception was from uh, quantum computing, so very, very different from gravity. It's things, you know, uh, a little quantum bit being flipped up and down on, on, a, on a lattice. It's, it's like uh, thinking about the structure of our, this table and looking at, you know, what, what can change if I, if I put uh, quibits on it, like a, a, an up and a down spin, and I try to do quantum computation, which is like this, this area of instead of a one and a zero with a normal computer, you have like a, a combination of that. So instead of a, a yes and a no in a, in a computer, you can have a maybe. Um, and so this whole area of quantum computing has developed into very theoretical methods where they kind of try to, um, that's way too much, um, they try to come up with new materials in which they can place um, these quantum bits, these little, instead of an up and a down, they have a maybe. It's like always, always at a different value. And they try to get new materials with which they can, they can use that quantum computer. Um, and so I was completely unfamiliar with quantum computing uh, several years ago. And the fact that this paper had cited it and that it used a completely different language. Um, I, I, I read through the paper and I was like, this doesn't look anything like what I was doing. Um, and yet they cite um, the paper that I'm working on and say that, oh, this could, um, this could be, you know, here's the paper I was working on. And they say, oh, on the more formal side, uh, this could probably generate a more general procedure for this whole, um, this whole topic, which is like the topic of, of the way that different bits can interact with each other when you're talking about a quantum computer, and how, um, how you, can, you can look at things that optimize that. Like for instance, this theory of fractons was someone who was trying to build a memory. They were trying to build memory for a quantum computer and talk about data that can be held in those bits. And out of thin air, they, they came up with this, with this crazy theory of how these particles can move. And it turns out that this author showed that the theory of, of symmetries and gauge theory can be used on it and, and cited the paper I was working on. And so it kind of sent me down a rabbit hole of learning all of these things were just only a few years ago were just completely baffling to me. They are all uh, what's called condensed matter topics, which I had never been trained in. Um, I was more math uh, oriented. And so the last few years I've been more or less trying to form a dictionary between these, between these two fields trying to get two people in two completely different communities to talk to each other and use the same map. Because if everyone's using the same map, um, then we can talk to each other. Um, so that was probably a lot. Um, please uh, ask every question you could possibly ask. Um, there is uh, no such thing as a dumb question. Uh, even you know if you were asking if mayonnaise is an instrument, um, there's no, there's no question. So please ask, ask everything.